Now it's the most ambitious mission yet in the billionaire space race. On Thursday, Jared Isaacman became the first non-professional astronaut to walk in space in partnership with Elon Musk's SpaceX. But was it truly valuable for science or was it a mere vanity project? Well, here to try to answer is Peter O'Brien. Hi, Peter. Hi, um, So as to that question, uh, reactions from the aerospace community um, have differed, I think it's fair to say, from uh, those in the general public. Yeah, as he emerged from the Crew Dragon capsule, Jared Isaacman said, down there we've got a lot of work to do, but up here it looks like a perfect world. Q all the Twitter comments coming in saying it's only perfect for billionaires or it's not perfect because of billionaires or, you know, billionaires, billionaires are doing the most damage to Earth. And while they might have, might have a point, we also saw other comments, notably on the Front 24 YouTube channel, people saying that actually the mission was fake, space is fake, the Earth is flat, um, perhaps more slightly unhinged comments there. But it seems that SpaceX engineers and investors have some convincing to do when it comes to the general public. But the aerospace community as a whole welcomed this mission and did see its benefits. For instance, uh, Gail Isles, Associate Professor of Physics at RMIT University in Melbourne, she compared it to Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin missions and said they were kind of space tourism when rich people would sort of just take suborbital joyrides and she compared that to this uh, this mission that we saw Polaris Dawn, Dawn and said here actually there has been a genuine contribute contribution to scientific knowledge and to the future of space flight despite the fact that SpaceX is obviously this mission has obviously been fi financed with private money. What then has been learned that could be taken forward to future missions? Lots of systems were tested that could be useful if, for instance in uh, NASA's Artemis mission to the moon, which plans to put people there uh, within a few years. For instance, the capsule itself called Resilience. This is the first time in half a decade that we've had a, ca a spacewalk happen without the aid of an airlock. So the capsule had to reduce its pressure to zero, then it could open up, the astronauts could go outside, they came back in, it closed up again, and the pressure returned to normal. That's not been done in decades. So it kind of proves that it could work and in future missions it might be useful as a way to save space on an airlock or just to have another way of doing it. Another development was the EVA spacesuit that was used, this extra vehicular activity spacesuit. Look at the ISS, the spacesuits they use to do spacewalks are 40 years old and they're known to have issues. Um, in this summer, um, as recently as June I believe it was, we had a, a water leak in one of these spacesuits and a spacewalk had to be cancelled. You don't want water filling up your spacesuit because you can drown. So to have another mission tested spacesuit that we know can perform spacewalks um, is definitely a good option to have on the table. Then there's the laser communication system that the Crew Dragon ship used to communicate with Earth. This is a new way of doing it. Although the video link did seem to cut out on the live feed that we were seeing, um, it did seem that the communications on the whole have been good and this could be a more efficient way to do things in future. Then there's just the milestone of it being the furthest that humans have been from Earth in decades. Uh, the orbit went up to about 1,400 kilometers above Earth. That's about three times the average altitude of the ISS. So although the moon is a lot further away still, it was a good step. And what other studies are being carried out at the moment? There are a total of about 36 experiments um, put together by about 31 different institutions as part of this Polaris Dawn mission. And there wouldn't be this much scientific interest if it were simply a vanity project. Nature interview interviewed a bunch of the scientists involved in these various missions and they are keen to insist that actually we're discovering lots of things to do with space flight's um, effect on human beings through this, on, on something on things like bone structure, on the effect on the blood, on the effect on the eyes, and the effects of radiation, because these astronauts went so far from Earth that actually they were subject to a lot more radiation than is normal for space missions. And the article points out that actually uh, Jared Isaacman is one of the few people to do two of these intensive sets of tests, because three years ago he financed and commanded um, the first crewed uh, all-civilian flight to orbit called Inspiration4. And what's next then for the Polaris missions? They've got lofty ambitions. Um, <laughs> Isaacman has been trying to convince NASA to, to let them fly up to the Hubble Space Telescope and 
perform a spacewalk to do some repairs and push it up higher into orbit to extend its lifespan. NASA's not said yes to this yet. It also is going to put the first humans onto SpaceX's X's, um, Starship, which is the most powerful rocket ever to launch. That's, of course, the vessel that NASA is hoping to use in its Artemis pro uh, program to ferry people to the moon. Do we need to go to the moon again, or for that matter, Mars? That depends on your point of view of humanity and what we're here for. Elon Musk obviously thinks that the existential risks here on Earth are so great that we need to colonize other planets. It's really up to you whether you think that we need to evolve as a species in this way. Did we need to evolve from hunter-gatherers to society makers? Lots of philosophical and existential questions in there, Haxi. I say yeah to it. Haxi says yes. Go okay, your stamp of approval. <laughs> Peter O'Brien, thank you very much. Thanks.